Hey everybody, welcome to another chapter of the Book of Sean. It's good to see you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. I got a great show for you. I got a great dad here tonight. He's a rapper and producer. BMW Kenny's here. We're going to talk about him being a father, about that. Listen, I'm a dad. He's a dad. We're going to have dad talk, all right? So my, my, my kids are, are, are a bit older than his, um, but I can't wait to listen to his heart and his journey and to hear how this miraculous thing that happens to us when we have kids did it happen to him? How, how's, he, how's he different? Um, you, you're going to be privileged tonight to listen to the heart of a black father. And we don't get to do that much in this culture, right? We, 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 we used to seeing black men yell, black men grunt, black men groan, black men, you know, make money. Black, but, but when do we get to hear the heart of a black man who loves his child, his daughter, and all that comes along with that, right? All of the apprehensions and fears and joys. And we're going to get to hear that tonight, okay? Uh, now, yes, he's a rapper and a producer. And so, you know, he, he knows how to turn up, you know what I'm saying, and, and do it for the culture. But tonight, he's here as a dad. I'm going to ask him most of my questions tonight are about him being a father. Some, some, about, you know, some about what he does for a living and how, and how he tries to find balance with all that. But listen, you're going to be blessed and inspired because you showed up. And because you get a chance to hear from my guest tonight, BMW Kenny. We're going to do some Ask Dr. Sean later on. I got some headlines for you people because I like to run my mouth. Play the bumper highly. Let's talk about pigs. <laughs> they didn't see that coming. Let's talk about, listen to this. This is going to bless you. Listen to this. Apparently researchers uh, have developed a system uh, using uh, a process using a system called Organex that enables organs to be recirculated, uh, which preserves uh, cells after uh, animals die. And they did this with pigs. So a, a group of pigs died and they were able to regenerate the cells in the bodies of the pigs. And, and they made certain organs come back to life after the pigs were dead for over an hour. And across the scientific community, he just said, wow, <laughs> across across the scientific community, people are hailing this as a major moment because it re it reinvents what we think about death. Right. Usually when you die, you figure, you know, the ghost of the person is gone. They're dead or the thing itself is dead. But now they found a way It's impressive. Right. They found a way to make the organs come back to life. And this is good news for people who need organ transplants, because now even after the organ has been, you know, away from the person for X amount of time, now more people can get more organs because now they can make more organs viable. OK, and I, I, I absolutely think this is a great discovery. But here's where we pick up the story, children. You ready? I would have been a lot more impressed with this story if they had not just brought back the organs, but brought back the pig. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Listen, if they had brought the pig back from death, I'm just saying, this would be a hell of a story. Now, I'm happy for the people who don't get the organs. I think that's a wonderful thing. But you talk about being impressive and astounding, bring a damn pig back to life. That would be a story. But here's the interesting part, because you guys know I go all kinds of directions. Even if they had brought the pig back to life, how much do you want to bet that it would not have been the leading story on the news because in America, we major in stupid stuff. <laughs> How much you want to bet that if scientists had found a way to bring a pig back to life, this crazy country, in this crazy country, that would not be the lead story on the news. We'd be talking about, I don't know, whoever, Kim Kardashian breaking up with the little boy, you know, because crazy stuff. Because that's what we, that's what we, and in fact, in fact, Tell me if you, I bet all the money in my pocket against all the money in your pocket that if they had brought a pig back to life, I mean totally back to life, TikTok would have ignored it. <laughs> it, it. It wouldn't even be on Instagram. Because in this country, we don't value important things. We value things that sort of make us more of what we already are. And you can tell a lot about a person not by what they say and not by what they acquire. You can tell a lot about a person by what they value and what they love. All I got to do to know who you are is to look at what you deem to be important to you. Yeah. So apparently, apparently God is still the only person that can bring dead things back to life. And unfortunately, 
TikTok doesn't care about that either. <laughs> you know that was funny. Let's do, let's do another one. Let's talk about lightning because um, I, I, I saw this story. I think it happened at the end of last week. Did you hear about the four people that were struck by lightning across the street from the White House? Three people died. Uh, James Mueller, Donna Mueller, both of them married um, uh, in their 70s. And they were visiting from Wisconsin and celebrating their 56th wedding anniversary when they were struck by lightning when a storm rolled through uh, and killed them. The third person also, uh, Brooks Lamberson, was only 29 years old when he was also struck by lightning and died. Apparently, all three of them tried to, all four of them rather, tried to shelter under a tree in the middle of the storm, which of course leads me to say, if you're ever in the middle of a storm and you see lightning, don't stand under a tree. It's just better to get wet. But then let me, let me, let, let, let me, let me, let me add, let me add something to make this story reachable and pliable. Because I told you when we started, there were four people that got struck by lightning. Three of them died. Of course, we send our condolences out to the families of the people who died. But one person survived. One person survived. Her name is Amber. Amber's, Amber was also struck by lightning. But the doctor said, listen to this, because this, this is where we're going to lean in, children. The doctor said that Amber's life was probably spared because of some quick thinking Secret Service agents. And also, wait for it, the rubber on the bottom of her shoes. Yes. You don't know when to throw your shoe because <laughs> you should have thrown your shoe. Right. Her life was spared, people, because of the rubber on the bottom of her shoes. We all wish Amber a, a speedy recovery. I want her to, to be well and as quick as she possibly can. But can you imagine the story she's going to be able to tell people when she gets out of the hospital? That she was struck by lightning and the only thing that saved her was the rubber at the bottom of her shoes? You know, if, if, I've had a near death experience. If you've had a near-death experience, you are grateful and glad that you're alive all the time. But you also have something called survivor's remorse. You also wonder, why is it the case that I survived this experience and the people who were there with me did not? And, and, and I'm going to leave that to, you know, other therapists and health, health, mental health professionals who specialize in that to talk about that and help Amber deal with that. But here's the thing that I know for sure is that Amber, for the rest of her life, she's going to be able to tell people that the thing that killed three other people was not strong enough to kill her. Come on, y'all. <laughs> you, you know that was good. <laughs> Let's do a couple more before I bring up my man, BMW Kenny. Let's talk about sleeping. BMW Kenny, listen to this story, right? Listen to this story, brother. Listen to this. So... I love this job tremendously. This is what I love to do. I enjoy doing this. I think I'm pretty good at it. Um, but I think I found my dream job. I think I just found a job that I love more. Casper, which is a New York-based mattress company, listen to this, they're hiring people to sleep. <laughs> it's my dream job, people. They're hired, they want to pay people, yes, they're paying people to go to sleep. They're asking people to sleep in their stores, and in unexpected settings around the world. And I'm not sure that that means, um, I, I, don't, I don't know what that means that they want people to sleep in unexpected settings, but here's what I, I don't care. <laughs> Wherever you want me to sleep and you want to pay me, I'm just willing to do that. Yeah. Have we gotten to the place where we're paying people to sleep? Like, why didn't this happen to me sooner? <laughs> I, I want this job. Now, I like the one I got. But paying people to sleep? Listen, okay, so here it is. You know when you ask people what your dream job is <laughs> and people come back and tell you, uh, most of the time they don't have an answer because they don't know what their dream job is, okay? Um, but this is really my dream job. And, but, but, but here's the problem with it. For everybody in your life, and there's, there's somebody in your life right now who does nothing but sleep most of the time. <laughs> we all have that one or two people in our life. We've got, got a cousin or a friend, and they spend most of their time sleeping, right? Lounging on the couch. Now you know where to send them. Send them to the Casper Mattress Company in New York because now they can get paid for what they're doing for free. Okay? Yes. And how do you tell somebody, I don't want that job? Like, if you refer somebody to, 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 to get paid for sleeping, 
How, how can they say to you, you know, I, I can't do that. <laughs> what? <laughs> how in the hell can you not do that? So listen, people, for all the lazy people and all the, all the sleep addicted people in your life, the great God of heaven has finally created an opportunity for them too. Isn't it good to know that no matter who you are and what your pathologies are, life will make room for you to grow and have a chance to stand in the sun. And this is the opportunity for everybody who likes to sleep a lot. But I do have one more thing here. If you get this job, don't lose this job. Because there's no explaining to anybody how you lost a job where they pay you to sleep. Let me do one more. Let's talk about Serena Williams. We heard uh, yesterday, I believe, was it yesterday? I think it was yesterday, uh, that Serena Williams is going to retire at the end of the U.S. Open this year. She's going to begin to focus on other things that are important to her. And, um, you know, for all of us who have been Serena Williams fans, um, to hear of her pending retirement comes as a moment of sadness but also joy because we got to watch her grow up. We got to watch her go from being a little girl to being a woman to being a champion to being a wife, to being a mother. And we celebrate her. We celebrate her in spite of the fact that the country that she lives in never adequately celebrated her at all. You remember when, Ven when Venus and Serena Williams used to go to Indian Wells out here in California and they were treated with disrespect and racist insults by the crowd out here. And what did Venus Williams and Serena Williams decide to do? They stopped playing Indian Wells because they had dignity and self-respect. They chose dignity over dollars and they decided we will forego the money, then have somebody treat us any kind of way. Serena Williams is a class act. And when she broke into tennis, she was not celebrated by the tennis establishment or the sports media. And that was only because she was black. Tennis has always been a bastion for whiteness, and it continues to be. But for these two little black girls to dominate tennis the way that they did, it was unsettling for a lot of people. And here's what I want to say. In her own way, Serena Williams shook up the world. I got, I, got a, I, got a, I got a dad on tonight who is the father of a little black girl. And these connections are random, right? I mean, God in the universe sort of makes these things come together. Because we didn't plan to have BMW Kennedy on on the night when I would be talking about Serena Williams, the father of a little black girl, and celebrating a black woman who is an inspiration for little black girls. See, but little black girls have looked up to her for over 20 years. And for over 20 years, she has given them something to watch, something to marvel at. She has shown them what is possible and what can be achieved. You know, there are athletes right now who can't even deal with the pressure that Serena was dealing with for 20 years. There are athletes in tennis who win one grand slam and they can't even handle the pressure. I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying it makes Serena even more impressive that for 20 years, She's been dealing with the spotlight and the pressure. Because I tell you all all the time, bright light come with hot heat. She's been dealing with the heat and the light and handling it with grace and style. And so on behalf of tennis fans and black people and, yeah, Americans everywhere, I simply want to thank you, Serena Williams. Thank you for what you gave to us. Thank you for all that you were. Thank you for your brightness, your ebullience, your power, and your strength. Thank you for never backing down. Thank you for giving it everything that you had. Thank you, Serena Williams, that little black girls will know henceforth and forevermore that they can be exactly what you are, a champion, a woman of decency, a woman of determination and pride. There's a whole list of people who conjure around you, Serena, the ancestors who gather and who tip their hats to you because you have added to the legacy of our greatness and our excellence. You stand on the shoulders of those who are proud to have you standing on their shoulders. And you are an asset to our people and to our struggle. And for good people of goodwill around the world, whether they be black or white or gay or straight or male, whatever you may be, anybody who knows anything about what it means to give it everything, we respect you. So I leave you with this, Serena. You did well. And you did it well for a long time. I wish you gratitude and celebration that more than anything else, my dear sister, I wish you love. All right, let's take a break. When I come back, my brother Kenny will be here. We're going to talk about being a black father. 
Loving your little girl. Yeah. A daughter will change you, people. Your kids will change you. Yeah. We'll be right back right after this. Bam. Welcome back, everybody. I am a dad, and I think being a father is an amazing thing. Um, but it can also be terrifying on a certain level, right? You know? And let's be honest. Nobody, there, there aren't, when you, when you have a kid, there's no classes. No, no, nobody tells you what to do. You know, they, they might tell you how to hold the baby, you know, but that's it. What to do, what not to do, how do you deal with the ups and downs, and how do you manage your own pursuit of greatness? My guest tonight knows that journey, and I'm happy to have him. Welcome to the show, welcome to the show tonight. BMW Kenny, what's up, Kenny? What's going on? What's going on, man? It's, uh, it's good to see you, good to have you. Thank you for being uh, a part of this tonight. I want to get right to it um, uh, because you know, we, we don't have all the time that I wish we would have. And so let, let, let me ask you this. Um, cause I, I want to take you back to the moment. What did it feel like when you became a father? Um, what did it feel like, man? It felt like a weight of pressure was added onto my <laughs> shoulders. Felt like, okay, now it's time to really like be a man. This is the test. It's the test. Are you gonna? Are you really gonna fail this test? Or are you gonna come through, be successful? And me, I never fail at anything. Like you know, so I took it as another challenge in my life, the next chapter, and um, I took it on headstrong. Mm, so you felt you felt pressure. You felt pressure. What what was the first thought that came in your mind? And I, I'm and listen, just just be totally transparent right now. When you heard when you heard you were gonna be a dad, what was your first thought? Um, my first thought was, as a black man, I do not want to be a, another statistic, you know, as far as like in the father realm, you know, there's a lot of men that get put into un unfortunate situations and they not be able, they're not there to be a father. That was there. your and first I, thought? I, say that one more time. I said that was your, because my, my first thought was, uh-oh. <laughs> no, I actually was like I waited to that. I, I was in a good place in my life, like financially, career wise. Like I was just like, it wasn't a pressure on like, can I take care of the baby? It was more of a pressure, like, you know, me and the girl weren't together, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want the situation to look like he's not there. Yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it, I get it. It was so, more of a situation. So, Kenny, Kenny, let, let me ask you this: Did did you feel? Did you? I'm gonna ask you three questions in one. Did, did you feel inadequate? Honestly, did you feel any fear? Honestly, and and here's the last one. Were you ready? Um, inadequate? No. I felt like I was definitely the man for the job. Um, not traditionally, the way it's been brought up through generations as far as getting married and being in a relationship and you know that wasn't adequate but um the fear only fear I had was uh pretty much me not being there for my daughter mm -hmm. because we were both in two different states um and was I ready yes that I, I would felt like I was at an age where I was taking care of grown men and you know, paying their bills, having them staying at my house, there was a lot of that going on, and I felt like I needed a change in my life. So I felt like it was the perfect, um, I guess, kickstart for me to change my life. Hmm. So, 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 as 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 a father, and as the father of a little girl, um, what are some of the things that you strive to do in her life, or to model in her life? Um. One, I, as a father, I want to be the balance to her, um, her like her her thought process, you know. Because sometimes, um, not to be too general, but I've dealt with a lot of females sometimes, and they they don't think logical; they think emotional. And I want to be the balance that gives my girl like okay it's cool to be emotional but it's, you have to be logical mm -hmm. you know and sometimes logic isn't what you want logic is just is what it is 
And, you know, if you can understand that reality, I feel like you'll get your heart broken less and you can stay focused on what you want to do in life. Yeah, so so what, what, what I hear you, I'm, I'm going to say it a bit differently, but, but what, what I hear you saying is that you want to be a sounding board and, and, and a repository for wisdom for her so that she can come to you and have someone who can say, now, the way you're looking at this in the moment may not be the best way to sort of process it. Um, you, 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 you mentioned women, so I'm, I'm going to ask you this question, and, and, and please don't be particular and don't mention anybody. Of course, of course, um, of course. Um, but here's the question, though. How has having a daughter made you rethink how you view how you behaved in other relationships? Oh, man. Looking at my daughter, it's just sometimes it's heartbreaking to look at it because I just know that as a man, I want to be what I want her to find, you know? So it's helping me change myself, you know, over time. I feel like. In what way? Uh, It's changing me in a way that how I respect women Hmm. how I um I'm more just patient she's t- she's taught me a lot of patience you know um so sometimes I used to be short-tempered and I used to be kind of um just bothered if I get bothered it's kind of like I'm over it and um my daughter just has kind of taught me to like relax chill breathe because she's testing me every day. Um, she's with me. And it's one of those things, man, that if you don't have a kid, you just won't know. Or if you're not active, you just won't know what it is in every particular moment. When you with a little girl or, you know, you got a son or whatever. If you got a little girl, it's just, you got to be the man that, you know, and it, it changes you, you know, like you want to be a good man. Yeah, you know, no, it's most most men. Yeah, right, indeed, indeed, most most men of any character of any of any decency would uh, would want to respond to having a daughter by doing what you did, which is really to learn and uh, express more respect uh, for the women in your life and the women in your past. But you, you're, yeah. you're, you're you're here tonight because you're a good dad who wants to be a great dad, or you're a great dad who wants to be an even greater dad. Here's my question with respect to that. Tell me what what's your image, your view of what a great father is. When I say when I when I say great a great father, what comes to mind? Um, a great father is a person that is really a, attentive in every aspect of a kid's life. Um, growing up, I didn't necessarily have that hmm. like like dad I want to try hmm. skateboarding hmm. all right let's go to the store let's go buy you some equipment let's let's get you let's get you setting you, you want to do it let's try it I didn't have that type of um personality to push me to to finding things you know so um I feel like with me with my daughter it's more like let's try what you want to do you know um I feel like being a great father is just pushing your kid into their greatness, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and and not slowing them down, not because your career is slowing them down. I want to be in a position where I don't have to balance, you know, of my career and my being a dad because my kid needs a hundred percent me. She doesn't need, she don't need 60%. And a lot of times when I focus on my music and I focus on career stuff, it's like, of course my baby comes first, but baby, like, relax, hold on. I'm doing this, typing emails, I'm on the phone, making music. You know, I feel like I'm not at my potential. Yeah, yeah, um, no, yeah. no, I hear, I hear you, and we're we're, we're going to talk about that balance in a second. But 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 you mentioned something that I that I want to just just dwell on for a moment, and by asking you this question. Did anybody teach you how to be a father? Yeah, I have a father. I have a dad. We just um, we just rekindled our relationship. We were off for about two, two, three years. 
Um, but but yeah, I, I had a dad. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm asking a different question, though. I'm, I, yes, I, I, I <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is what I okay, do. Okay, no, no, no. <laughs> I get now. I, I don't want my dad to be mad, you know. But uh, we talked about it, you know. My dad has taught us some valuable things, but it's a couple things we missed out. Yeah. We missed out on as far as having a father influence teaching us how to do things and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Kenny, I'm going to cut you off because I want to make sure we don't get in any trouble, okay? Um, So so, so let let me say this. Whenever, I'm going to put it on me, not on you. When when, when I have a critique, so I, I, I grew up, my mom raised me. I didn't have a dad. My mom was not the most affectionate person in the world. She was strong and she was courageous but not affectionate. When I say that, that's not a condemnation of her, right? That, that's just me articulating my experience with her. <laughs> you know, it's just, that's just from my, from my perspective, that's what I got. And so, and so, you know, what you just gave us, it's just your perspective of, of, of what you got. Um, but here's what, I, here's what I heard, and you tell me if I got this wrong. Um, I'm, I'm hoping we got this right. You had your daughter for the entire month of July, Yep, and first for the first time we um not say it was in a trial, it was court ordained. Uh I got her for the month. And it was the first time I had her. Uh and it was a roller coaster show. Yes, I wanna hear about I've been wanting to ask you this all day. What happened? <laughs> uh um first off, it was fourth of July. And my I was promoting the album that month, so it was really honestly worst timing for me i probably never uh since i got her every year i probably never do another album in the summer probably never um but the attention i needed to get to her from six in the morning july 1st to 2 p.m august 1st was ridiculous (laughs) ridiculous for one man Mm. i feel like that moment right there made me feel like, wow, like maybe it is cool to be like in a relationship or be married to do this with another person because it really took a toll on my mental and I, I, I kind of saw myself kind of lashing out a little bit, you know, over emotional with my own daughter. She don't know nothing, no better, you know? And it's like, if I had that relief to go like, Please ha- handle, you know, ha- handle her. <laughs> I'm gonna go take a break, take a walk. Like I will have that balance. But um, every day uh, had headaches. Um, I grew a couple of gray hairs in this mo- in, in July. Mm. Um, mm. um, and you hold, hold on, uh, Kenny, hold on, hold on, Kenny. And your your <laughs> your your daughter is four years old. She's turning four in two months. She turns four in two months. Listen, I I, I, I got to take this break because after telling that story, I can tell you need to recover. Just 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 Woo! just remembering it, reliving it is, is wearing you out. Man. <laughs> it was just the tip of the iceberg, but it was so much. But yeah, we can go back. Yeah, we'll we'll, break, we'll 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 come back to it right after this break. And I, I'm also going to okay. ask him about that work life balance because that's a part of why he's here tonight is to work on how he can manage that better. Um, everything he just said just makes you honor and respect people who are parenting by themselves, right? And if you and yeah. if you if you were raised by a single parent, by the time this show is over, you need to send them a text or make a phone call and say thank you because he's absolutely right. Now you know that the person who raised you, whoo, they had a lot going on, but they did it anyway. Let's take a break. We'll be right back right after this. Welcome back, everybody. I'm talking to rapper and producer, the one and only B.W. Kenny. So my brother Kenny, um, uh, let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question. Well, before, before, before I ask him this question, let's, let's level set, right? And let's level set and know that if you ain't getting nothing out of this so far, here's the one thing you need to get out of it. That being a parent is not something to play with. It ain't easy. It will test you and you will have to grow. You will have to change, Okay. And let me say this, you're going to have to change because who you are when they are four cannot be who you are when they're 18. As they grow, you have to grow. All right, Kenny, let me bring you back. You ready? Um, Yes, I'm in there, man. So so you 
um, part of why you, 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 you are you're, you're a rapper, you're a music producer, and, and you, have, you have a vibrant career, you're actively engaging in what you love to do. Uh, here's my question, because you've alluded to this a few times, you've hinted towards it, I wanna go right at it. How do you handle the balance between being a dad and chasing your own greatness, your own, your own legend? How do you do that? Oh, I mean, I think being a um, single, uh, being a single dad has its advantages as well as its disadvantages. So I don't want to put that, you know, um, you know, idea out there that being a single dad is horrible. No, if you have a person that's co-parenting with you and y'all got a good relationship or a good talking relationship, um, it can be a break for you to do what you got to do in your career when you're not with the kid. And then when you're with the kid, you put that to the side and give the kid a hundred percent. So, um, it, it's been a different, it's been a different challenge, but you know, I, I don't want to speak bad on, 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 just, just know. No, 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 Kenny, 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 you know? Kenny, Kenny, <laughs> hold, hold on. To know. Kenny, Kenny, hold on, hold on. I, I, I get, first of all, I, I, I respect what you're saying and I respect the way you want to sort of frame this. But 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 you you also have the right to sort of tell your experience, right? Yeah. And, and and to say, listen, um, this work parent balance right. is hard no, as I didn't hell. Know what kind of show this was? I no, didn't know no, 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 no. Real, real. Yeah, listen, listen. Let's. I because because and hold on a second. When I asked you the question, your face changed. Oh. When 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 you opened your mouth, you you filtered it through your head. But, oh, when yeah. I, but when I asked you, this, yeah, yeah, but I, I, I want, I want what was on your face. What, what, what came over you when I asked you this question? Um, women, uh, uh, fun, hang with the homies, studio, um, the regular me who I was before I was a kid. I mean, before I had a kid, mm. um, trying to deal with that struggle of do I let it go? Or do I just do I balance it out and just have my days when I can still be a rock star and then days when I can be a straight up dad at home that I cook for my daughter every day. I change her clothes, bathe her, use the bathroom three, four times a day. I'm there every time. It's different from going to the club, popping bottles, uh, you know, going on nice dates and going on trips and being with your friends and stuff like that, you know? So, you know, I think that I've had a great life so far and mm -hmm. the fear of missing out isn't there with me. And that's what makes you also a great parent too, I think. You don't got that fear of like the FOMO of, man, I don't care who's performing at the club tonight. Like, I don't care. Kenny. I'm with, I'm with my kid tonight, you know? Kenny. See you next week. You know, that's kind of how been my, my mentality. Kenny. It's been working out. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm 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 gonna push you a little bit, okay? Can, can I push you a little bit? Do I you have your permission? Yeah. Because yeah. because my, my sense of you tonight is that a part of the tension and the struggle that you're having is that a part of you does wanna, you know, be able to live the life and have the fun and have the opportunity that you had before you became a parent. That there is some of that that you actually miss. But you also love your daughter. And you also want to be there for her. And that is the tension. If, 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 if both those things aren't true, then there's no tension. But, but, but I, what I sense in you is that you do have a tension. And it is a normal, just, just hear me on this. It is a normal feeling. You are not abnormal you are not bad parent you are not bad it when, when you're in a different stage you have to process what you're doing differently so here's my question for you do you accept the stage that you're in yes it was hard to accept it mm. like i had to when i when i was with her for that month of july mm -hmm. that's when it hit me um there's no turning back it already was no turning back, but like, yeah. this is your responsibility. It's no one else's. You can't depend on your mom. You can't depend on no one to help you out. This is yours. You by yourself. Yeah. 
And that's what really, like, it changed me. Just this month of July, it's only August. This month of July definitely changed me as a man. And I, it helped me and her, my daughter's relationship. Like, we bonded so much, like, and I we haven't because I was gone in a different state. And I just moved here to be closer to her. So I was, it was a struggle, but it was like, yo, it's just molding. You know, when you mold in something, it's, not, it's never supposed to be an easy process, you know? Mm. Yeah, listen. Chiseling a rock. Yeah, I, I got I gotta let you go, but let, let, let me let me say one thing to you, um, and and it's just it's just from one father to another, right? For this is just two dads talking. Um, I, I, I'm I'm further along on the journey. My my kids are, are way way past four years old. I mean, my my kids have kids. <laughs> oh, wow. so, so that, I I look young and beautiful. I know, I know, I know. You, you can't even imagine it, right? But 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 here but here's what I want to say to you, okay? Um, I think you're going to figure this out. You are going to ultimately figure out that the vision you have for your daughter can be maintained alongside of the vision you have for your own life. That these two things don't have to be in tension, they can be in conversation. And so mm-hmm. going forward, what I want you to do is to make sure that you spend a part of your day or a part of your week make, intentionally being a dad and then a part of the day or a part of the week intentionally being an artist. You see, what you have to do is when you have help, when you have help, you can just sort of just play it by ear. When, 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 you, when you don't have that, right, you have to be intentional. So I'm saying to you is just as long as you plan it, as long as you uh, think about it, work your way through it, then you'll be able to get there. But the hardest thing is always going to be the emotional part. There's always going to be the part of you that loves your daughter to death, but also, and I'm going to use this word, you didn't use it, I'm using the word, not you, also resents the fact that you can't work on the things you want to work on as much as you'd like to work on them. And as, as, as long as you can process that resentment, right, and allow that resentment to turn into something else, whatever it is, then I believe you're going to be fine. Um, I've enjoyed listening to your journey tonight. And man. Go ahead. Man, I, I appreciate you having me. And uh, one thing out of this, man, I respect to all the mothers out there, all the single parents out there. Um, it's a journey. It's hard. But, you know, we got it. And uh, I know it ain't easy now. I'm part of the gang. I'm part of the single parent gang. I'm with y'all. Let's get it. Yeah. I got some good news for you. and got some bad news for you, Kenny. The good news is being a dad is great, and the bad news is it don't get no easier. <laughs> Listen, I got to let Kitty go. Uh, when we come back, we're going to do some Ask Dr. Sean. I'm going to say a few more words about this, about fatherhood. Uh, yeah, keep Kenny in your prayers. <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. So you had a chance to listen to Kenny and hopefully connect with him. Uh, you were able to hopefully see that there's a tension, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a negotiation. Because often when you are, are used to being in one stage of your life and you're thrusting into another, you, you sort of lament. You sort of have nostalgia for the stage that you were in. Especially when that stage happens to also connect with your career and your ability to have your own dreams. You know, because again, when you, when you become a parent, you don't stop having your own dreams, right? You still want to do something with your life and as much as you want your kid to have theirs. That's the journey he's on, and it's complicated. It's emotional, right? I was, I was very happy to be able to stop him and say, no, no, give me, give me, give me what that was, because I saw his face change. I saw his face change. And, and, and what that was was him sort of being honest in the moment to say, not only is this hard, this is confusing. Yeah, but he said it best probably. Kenny said it best at the end. Shout out to all the parents who are getting it done. I don't know how you do it, alone, together, whatever it is. You're raising beautiful little girls and little boys and all of us out here in the rest of the world. Thank you for the work that you're doing and the sacrifices that you made. And just like I said to Kenny, I also want to say to you, keep your dream alive, okay? Because your children will be most blessed and most edified, not by what you give them, but by what you show them when you chase and accomplish your dream. All right. Let's do some match, Dr. Sean. Highly play the bumper, man. 
Yes, yes, yes. We got a little segment called Ask Dr. Sean. It's called Ask Dr. Sean. Yes, it is. So, I'm assuming we got a video because we always got a video. Let's play the video. Hello, Dr. Sean. My name is Lamar. I'm from Los Angeles. Do you think you can have sex with a friend without any strings attached? Dr. Sean, give me your advice. All right, all right. Highly play that again. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Sean. My name is Lamar. I'm from Los Angeles. Do you think you can have sex with a friend without any strings attached? Dr. Sean, give me your advice. Oh, that's an interesting question. Can you have sex without any strings attached? Ooh, I don't... I, ooh, it de- first of all, it depends on the people, right? Depends on the people. There are no hard-written, hard-wired rules. So we don't necessarily want to say... In all cases, no, or all cases, yes. But I wager to believe that in, in the majority of the cases, it's very difficult for people to engage in sexual intercourse without there ultimately being some feelings and some sense of possession, ownership, loyalty, accountability, connection. Um, because well, let's be honest about sex. Sex is a very connecting thing, right? <laughs> you you up in somebody's body. <laughs> it's not like, you know, it's not a passe kind of thing. Now, I do recognize that there are people nowadays who can, you know, for whom it's just a physical interaction and, and, and that's how they're built. And that may be how you're built. But you should not assume that other people are built that way. And if you engage in sleeping with them, you will probably have to also engage in some kind of emotional management. And let me tell you something, okay? People lie. (laughs) Here's what I mean by that. People will tell you in the beginning, oh, I'm fine with it just being about sex. Oh, it's fine. And then somewhere in the middle, they've developed feelings and connections and emotions that are going to have to be dealt with. And just because you had an understanding in the beginning doesn't mean that somebody hasn't changed the terms in the middle, all right? And just because you're still functioning under the original agreement, doesn't mean you don't have to deal with the fallout and the messiness that comes when a person ultimately decides, unbeknownst to them sometimes, that they actually want to have more with you than what they originally agreed to, agreed to rather. It's complicated. I personally think that whatever it is you engage in, that you engage in a conversation before you engage in something else. Because at the very least, you want to let people know what they're getting themselves into. You want people to know that you're only here for the physicality. You're only here for the creature craving. You just want your eyes to roll up in the back of your head. You are not here for the romance. You are not here. Let people know that. And then people have to be responsible for making a grown folks decision as to whether or not they're willing to agree with what it is you're willing to offer. I just happen to think that when it's all said and done, People at their best, and this just could be my thing coming out, people at their best, at the level of their highest achievement, want more than just sex. I think people actually want connection. People want to be surrounded by people who love them and trust them and are loyal to them and respect them and honor them and inspire them and can reach them and listen to them. And there may be people out there who don't want that, But I bet you those people who don't want that have been through things that made them not want that. Because no baby comes out of their mama's belly talking about, I don't want nobody to love me. I don't want nobody to be emotionally connected to me and I don't want to give myself emotionally. That's not how it happens. People go through trauma and difficulty and they arrive at a place where they settle for what is physical and no longer aspire or hope to get something more than that. So to answer your question succinctly, although this was not a succinct answer, of course it's possible. But that's not what I wish for you. I wish you love. Let me take a break. We'll be right back right after this. Welcome back, everybody. So, you know, always great videos, and I'm always grateful for them, just so you know. So please continue to send them and to send us direct messages and all of that. So here's a question that someone um, DM'd me. Uh, I went on a date with a woman I really like. I took her to a high-end restaurant, and the bill was over $500. At the end of our date, she thanked me for the dinner, and to my shock, her ex-boyfriend arrived to drive her home. (laughs) Should I send her a cash app and request uh, my money back or take it as a loss? 
Okay. Interesting question, interesting scenario. I'm sorry this happened to you. But let me give you some advice because, you know, that's why you, you wrote to me and that's what I'm here to do. Before you do any of the things or either of the things that you suggested in your um, message to me, why don't you do something far more effective, efficient, and radical and have a follow-up conversation with the woman? Why don't you talk to her about what happened that night so that you can have more information so as to ascertain what your response should be? Because right now, whatever your response is or will be without talking to her, you've invented based, based upon maybe half of the information you need to create or conjure an appropriate response. You see, if you really liked her, then like her enough to give her an opportunity to express and to explain to you what's going on here. Because I agree with you, it's a little odd, it's a little strange for the ex-boyfriend to show up to pick her up. I'm also interested in knowing how you knew it was the ex-boyfriend, but that's none of my business. The point is you need to have a follow-up conversation and not just rush to do what we do on social media, which is to respond, to reply, to, you know, to snap back. Talk to her. Because it may be the case that they're ex, they're ex-boyfriend and girlfriend, but they're also still great friends. And she doesn't have a car. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there could be a legitimate reason why this is happening. You at least need to hear it before you sort of decide that this is no longer worth your time and start sending cash apps to ask you for your money back. But let me answer the question that you ask, because <laughs> I strive to do that. When you take somebody on a date, at least where I come from, you take somebody on a date and you're the one that asked the person out on the date and, you know, you paid for the date, you pay for the date. To me, I think it's tacky to ask for some for your money back at the end of a date. I, I don't I would not do that uh, unless under some extreme circumstance, you know, but even then I'm probably just going to take it as a loss because I need to feel the pain of the decision that I made to ask you out in the first place. And, 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 if I, and if I ask for my money back, then that's going to make me have to have more contact with you and more discussion. And I have to be honest with myself about which one that I really want. Am I trying to get rid of you because I'm upset? Or am I trying to find a, a sneaky way to hold on to you and not have the courage to admit it? So if I, if I go out on a date with you and your ex shows up and takes you home, and even though I'm mad, I'm probably not asking for my money back. Because I need, first of all, I asked you out, I paid for it, and whatever mistake that I made by not seeing in you what would make you capable of doing something like that, I need to feel that pain because that pain is going to be corrective. So I'm going to take my loss and say to myself, never again am I paying $500 for a dinner (laughs) for anybody else. All right, let's look at another video somebody sent in. I think this is going to be great. Let's watch. Hi, Dr. Sean, my name is Tiana and I'm from the Bronx. I recently just graduated with my bachelor's and I'm currently receiving my master's in childhood education. I recently was offered a teaching position at an elementary school and I just wanted to know what is some advice that you can give me to balance it all? Ooh, great question. First of all, congratulations on your achievement and your accolade and the procurement of a mind that is worthy of the culture, the people, And maybe hopefully one day the country that it was groomed and raised in. So I celebrate you. I celebrate your mind. How do you keep the balance? Well, it's kind of what I said to Kennedy tonight. Sometimes you have to be intentional. You have to be very intentional about what you're doing and what time of the day that you do it. Um, You don't seem like the kind of person based upon what you've achieved and what you want to do with your life that is given or common. It's not a common experience for you just to fly by the seat of your pants. Don't ever expect to have balance as you're flying by the seat of your pants because you're just given to how you feel. And emotions are not equitable. They don't, they don't equally apply. We can be extravagantly, exuberantly happy and focused on something for half the day. And then the rest of the day, we get, we're in nine different places. You have to be intentional, making sure you give your time to the things that deserve your time and the things that add to your life. And don't think yourself strange because you have to schedule, right? You have to plan. And you see other people just doing whatever they want to do. But they're doing whatever they want to do, but they're not going where you're trying to go. They don't have the same opportunities that you do. They can afford to just fly by the seat of their pants because they're not flying. They ain't going nowhere. You are going somewhere. 
And you've got to be intentional. I don't know any great, and I know a lot of great people. I know billion. I've, I've been, I've been around billionaires, millionaires, presidents, uh, former presidents. Nelson Mandela. He's the only one I can name because he's no longer with us. Trust me, I've been around some people, and all of them are very strategic about their time and how they appropriate their focus and their space, who they allow around them. Because you cannot be all things to all people. You cannot love all things equally. You can't love everything at the same time. You can't love everything and be devoted to nothing. So decide what your priorities are and what and, what and where you should give your time and your attention and stick to the plan. Because apparently you know how to finish. I said you know how to finish. And most people in this life never finish what they start. Yeah. So good luck, my sister. Do well. I'm believing in you. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Thank BMW Kenny for being here and sharing his machinations and joys and sorrows about fa being a father. All of you, enjoy the rest of your week and your day, and I will see you very soon. Be good to each other, okay? Because uh, I love you. Can't help it.